Welcome back to the game collection. Dragon Quest XI is a game that I've been hyped for ever since it was first announced. After all, it was the first numbered Dragon Quest game that we got in the West on a console since my all-time favorite, Dragon Quest VIII. But does Dragon Quest XI stand up to uh, the expectations of a full-on AAA role-playing experience? <laughs> well, let's find out. In Dragon Quest XI, the game begins with our teenage protagonist taking part in a coming-of-age ritual in the village of Cobblestone alongside his lifelong friend, Gemma. During the ritual, a monster attacks the two. In his attempt to save Gemma from careening off the side of the spire, a new power awakens from within our hero, saving the day. Our hero soon sets off to find out what this power is, what it's for, and what it means to be the Luminary. The story of the game builds slowly and somewhat predictably, at least at first. There's a strange sense of familiarity to the way the story unfurls, echoing stories that we've been hearing since childhood. I think that lulled me into a false sense of security because just when I least expected it, the game managed to completely blindside me, sending me reeling. Dragon Quest XI is the kind of game that feels like the story was composed thoughtfully. It has a certain rhythm to it that sucked me into the world of Erdria for hours on end. The overarching plot of Dragon Quest XI seldom takes center stage, and it's often a backdrop for our heroes to meet fun and interesting characters, some of whom join you along the way. The driving force for a good portion of the game is to collect a series of magical colored spheres that won't surprise many. But what the hero needs to do in order to acquire those, on the other hand, varies. Sure, a few might require delving into the deep depths of tombs and dangers unknown, while others may not require any real combat to speak of, and require the player instead to simply observe a story play out before them. Each of these orbs collected introduces the player to more of the world, the lore, the history of the Luminary of Legend, or the story of our companions. While many games seem to use dungeons as obstacles for the player, Dragon Quest XI saw them as opportunities to help build the world and tell a story. The colorful cast that made up my party had a chemistry to them that helped them feel like a tight-knit group of friends, or even family, far more than many games I've played in the past. When a party member hurts, you can feel them hurt, and when they are victorious, you too feel victorious. I would have personally loved to have seen a little more of each of the companion's backstories though. Jade and Rab's history in particular still has a lot of blank spaces that could have made for an interesting story, but these fall squarely into the realm of nice-to-haves, as most characters are fleshed out enough for the purposes of telling the bigger story. But it must be stated right out that Dragon Quest XI doesn't fall into the trap of taking itself too seriously. There are moments of tragedy and sorrow in the game that yank the carpet out from under you, but Dragon Quest XI always makes sure to give you a soft place to land. Dragon Quest XI will feel similar to players of any of the previous entries in the series. Dragon Quest has a history of iterating upon their successes rather than continuing to overhaul their battle systems for every new title, as seen with Final Fantasy. Because of this, I like to say that the more Final Fantasy changes, the more Dragon Quest stays the same. Dragon Quest XI's battle system continues to be a standard turn-based affair. The major difference between XI and previous titles is the addition of the pep mechanic, which you can sort of think of as a limit break that occurs randomly, but with increased chances the longer a battle extends. When pep power is active, the character's stats increase, and they gain access to pep abilities. When multiple active party members are pepped up, they can combine their pep abilities into powerful attacks, buffs, or battle effects. Using a pep power will cause the player to lose that pep status, and eventually pep status will fade away if unused. So coordinating pep powers with other party members can be tricky, but plays a pivotal role in the late game battles against end game bosses. I would be remiss not to mention though that with default settings the game can be very easy during the first couple of acts of the game. Draconian options are available to be enabled at the beginning of the game, but cannot be turned on after the game has started. Because I played the game on normal difficulty settings, I was pretty much able to auto-battle my way through most encounters, which I honestly kind of appreciated after my time with Octopath Traveler. 
but again, extra difficulty is there for those looking for more challenge or bragging rights. Another improvement in XI over its predecessors is that Dragon Quest XI now shows enemies on the world map, meaning that battles no longer occur randomly. Well, except for while sailing around anyway, on the high seas you still encounter battles randomly. But for the vast majority of your travel and exploration time, you'll be able to sprint around enemies you don't wish to bother with, or seek out specific baddies you want to farm for their drops. Because you can see monsters on the world map, you can also strike them preemptively to deal a bit of damage before the battle even begins, which is a pretty nice touch. And once you're properly leveled, weaker enemies will actually flee from you. One of my favorite mechanics from Earthbound making a rare appearance 20 years later. And speaking of farming of enemies for rare drops, you'll probably be doing quite a bit of that thanks to the new take on the crafting system. Previously in Dragon Quest VIII, we've seen alchemy pots where you could improve weapons and items by fusing them with certain other items. In Dragon Quest XI, you have a mini forge which you can also use to improve weapons and armor. The forging process is somewhat different in that you can now build items from raw ingredients rather than just improving existing ones. But there is a catch. Now the success of your forging depends largely on how well you can master the forging minigame. At the beginning of the game, you don't have many skills available to you, so you're more prone to failure. By the end game though, you'll be perfecting your creations without even trying. Outside of foraging in battle, there's a big world out there to explore, and our hero is able to do just that on both foot and mounted. Mounted on what though? Well, quite a few mounts are available as you explore the world, including the standard horse that you can pick up at a campsite, and even some defeated monsters can be ridden to gain access to previously inaccessible areas. For instance, riding on a skull rider will enable our hero to climb up sheer wall faces. Our hero has also been granted the ability to jump with the press of a button, which makes traversing the world and finding secret areas all the more fun and challenging at times. That said, there are plenty of invisible walls to keep the player from jumping up the side of mountains and jumping off cliffs, which can be a little annoying at times, but you gradually get a feel for it. Fall damage also doesn't exist in this game, which is both very handy and kind of hilarious at times. And lastly, it wouldn't be a proper Dragon Quest if there wasn't a casino with which you can kill hours of your life, winning tokens to be exchanged for rare equipment and crafting recipes. Playing solitaire poker with double or nothing mechanics was strangely addicting, but plenty of fun to do while watching someone on Twitch or listening to a podcast. The Dragon Quest series has always had a unique sense of humor about it, and at least part of that is owed to the incredibly charming and distinctive designs by Akira Toriyama. Most monster designs will be familiar to fans of the Dragon Quest games of the past, and they look stunning fully realized in high definition. The world in its entirety, in fact, is drop-dead gorgeous. Originally, the game was planned to be an open-world game, and while the idea had to be nixed for the sake of storytelling, the world that we have been presented with makes my imagination run wild at the thought of exploring an open-world version of it. But what we have is still fantastic. An interconnected continent, we do also get an overworld map, more or less, while sailing around the ocean surrounding the continent. The music within Dragon Quest XI is a point of contention for some. The included music is mostly comprised of a few throwbacks to previous Dragon Quest titles with a few new compositions and played back via synthesized instruments. This is a step down from Dragon Quest VIII's full orchestrations that the West was treated to for the PlayStation 2 release, but is par for the course for a Dragon Quest title all of which have featured synthesized instruments across all releases except for the PlayStation 2 release of Dragon Quest VIII in the West. In Japan, they also got synthesized instrumentals for that release. On the other hand, it does kind of suck that we didn't get a fully orchestrated soundtrack befitting of this otherwise definitive Dragon Quest experience. But on the other hand, I also didn't really care while playing the game. Some people are really bothered by the music, but for me, it was a total non-issue. The voice acting within the game was great overall. Honestly, I can't recall anyone or any lines that seemed to be out of place. The voices of each of the party members were varied and full of personality. There's no Japanese voice option as the game was never voiced in Japan, at least not until Dragon Quest XI S, which is coming to Nintendo Switch. 
With this release, Japanese gamers will finally get full voice acting, and if that version makes its way to the United States, then we might have Japanese voice options available. But it's kind of hard to fault the game for not including something that didn't exist to begin with. Dragon Quest XI was amazing and massive, about 150 hours long from start to finish, including the oh-so-satisfying 40 hour post-game content, even after which I didn't want the game to end, which is a really good sign by the way. And for all the reasons that I've already been talking about, the game's easily earned itself a spot in the game collection. For alternate recommendations, I don't think I could steer you wrong by recommending you check out Dragon Quest VIII on the PlayStation 2 or on the 3DS, or if you're looking for something a little faster paced, definitely check out Ease 8, which has got a completely different gameplay style, but it has a very similar tone overall.